All right, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for being a part of the Teleton. Uh, we are also here, we're here, the members of the Lagos, um, members of the team with the Lagos gubernatorial candidate, Mr. Gwadevor Rudzvaivo, and also you. other members, we have Mr. Kola and we have Mr. Shego. We're all members of the team, and we are so glad to be here today. Yes, it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> historic thing. And, and I'm very happy that a lot of people have tuned in and are also showing a lot of support. Donations have been coming in and people are really showing that they are really to get um, mobilized and help people, help us put in a leader that will be a servant leader. Oh yes, oh yes. And speaking of leadership and servant leadership, oh, my name is Priscilla Amadi, by the way, pardon me for forgetting to do that. Uh, we have our own servant leader in Lagos and we are so thrilled to hear what he has for Lagos, what's the plant for yeah. Lagos in a nutshell, basically, before we go into some nitty gritty. So I, I think that um, the key things that we're going to talk about today are mainly three pillars and issues that we're going to address. One, traffic situation in Lagos mm. State. Everybody mm. knows that the traffic situation in Lagos State has been unending and oh it's gotten days. worse and worse and some that must be tackled. And then also that directly links into housing and accommodation all across the state and also ties into the quality of development that and how it's going to happen across the state. And then lastly, youth unemployment. Oh my day. Which has which has reflected in so many ways. I mean from the agro situation that is constantly multiplying on the streets of Lagos everywhere in every corner. Um, and even the bus drivers are starting to complain about it and how they've become it, it, another level of governance mm. in the states that pretty much just takes, mm. milks the citizens, and you have a situation of monkey, the walk, baboon, the chop mm. um, being normalized in Lagos State. So, those are some of the topics that we're going to address. And if we have time, we'll delve into I other think. topics that can be more interesting um, oh, yes. to go into. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, we'll be doing a lot of that. And um, please. Please do note that um, as members of the team and supporting our gubernatorial candidate, one thing we are very happy about is the fact that our candidate is extremely capable, he has good character, he's competent, and he has proven in various ways that he's willing to take the bull by the horns. Um, considering that the current leadership has currently been there for over 20 years, um, having a fresh new leader, I mean, mm. take a look at us, we're looking all white. <laughs> take a look at us, so we are trying to do something that has not been done before and that's because we want our Lagos because everybody yeah. knows that Lagos is not working. So so what is it Mr. Kala? Uh, so briefly would you like to tell us what is it that your own concerns about Lagos? What are your concerns? Thank you very much. <laughs> I think the first thing we should um, realize is that by May 29 the current government you know will have been in power not for eight years uh, not for four years, but for 24 years. Mm. 24 years is a long period. Mm. In 1965, Lee Kuan Yew took over Singapore as mm. a third world country. Mm -hmm. By 1990, when mm. he was handing over, he handed over a first world country. Yeah. 24 years is a long time mm. to achieve almost total transformation mm. of a place. Now, sadly, the International Economist has done a review of the quality of life in 172 major cities in the world. Mm. And Lagos comes 171. That's a testament to how much better things could be. So I believe that Lagos can do much better. You know, I, I, I believe that Lagosians ought to realize mm. that they are the only place in Nigeria mm. that, as it were, are voting in two presidential elections. Yeah. And I know that. I, I say that. So, you know, Lagos is the only place where the governor, if he does the right things, has enough resources mm. to better the lives of the people, yeah. regardless of what is going on in Abuja. Exactly. You know, Lagos is a place where, in all of the West Coast, yeah. the next biggest economy after Nigeria is mm -hmm. Lagos. Mm. So, the reason why I'm here, I'm here also to speak for a generation, mm. if I have the time. Yes. Please, I'm go ahead. Please go ahead. I'm here to speak for my generation. <laughs> you see... Um, it's an Algerian philosopher, Franz Fanon. He said, every generation must, out of relative obscurity, mm -hmm. discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. You see, there's a generation of my grandfathers, mm. the generation of Habat Macaulay's mm. and Zeke and Awu. 
That generation got independence for Nigeria. Don't trivialize what they did. Mm. There were a small bunch of graduates who were essentially saying to the queen, before the queen was ready to go, yeah. leave us alone. They delivered that. Mm -hmm. The generation after that, but the generation of the soldiers, the General Obasanjo, the T.Y. Danjumas and co., you know, they may have foisted on us an imperfect union, but they did something. Mm -hmm. To keep Nigeria one is a task that must be done. Yeah. You see, my generation, those of us born from 1950 to 1969, it was our job to set this country on a path of irreversible progress. Mm. The path that will make us achieve our potential. And we failed. Mm. It is because my generation failed that we have this nation. Uh, we, we have this. Nothing is more symbolic of the failure of my generation than the fact that we have never chosen for ourselves who will be our ruler. There are only two people from my generation who have led the country. General, I mean, uh, President Yara Dua and um, Good Luck Jonathan. Those were anointed for us by the generation before us. Peter will be, will be the first time mm. that one of us will be waking up on his own terms and say, I want to be president. That's why I'm saying everybody born after 1950 has a duty. This is the last chance we have to select a president that is of our own making. One of us says, I want to be president. Not because President Obasanjo wants me to be president. Mm -hmm. Not because um, um, General Danjuma wants me to be president. Because I think I have ended this is our chance. Then the second thing is that because of the failure of my generation, those coming after us literally have no platform to stand on. Look at the rate at which they are abandoning the country. The excuse my generation used to give was to say that because of the army, that the army was in power and so we were incapacitated. No. Every generation has a big challenge. And I'm so delighted mm. that a young man trained in the best institutions, you know, a, a young man who has worked with some of the best organizations, Rather than opt to go and work abroad, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, I stayed close to what is going on in the country because it's determined to make a difference in Lagos. Mm -hmm. I've interacted closely with him. Yeah. So this is a generational call. If you are born from 1950 to 1969, you ought to vote Peter Obi because he's one of us. And you ought to vote Badi Borod's Viva because it is a generational debt to create a platform for those coming after us. And of course, if we are born after 1970, here is one of you who is saying, I've learned, I've gone to one of the best schools. I'm beyond going to one of the best. You see, we are all in white. Yeah. It was deliberate. Yeah. The candidates said, come in white. Development and corruption do not go together. Mm -hmm. Development and waste do not go together. Mr. Rodzweibo has severally told me that he reviewed the affairs of Lagos and found that projects are done at an average of 4x World Bank standard costs. Mm -hmm. That can't support development. So I want to say to everyone, if you are born after 1950, you have a duty to vote Peter Obi for president. And you have a duty to vote, vote Badibor Rodzweibo for governor. We will much be the better for it. 24 years. I mean, look at the bridges. If we built one new bridge every six years, we will be on the seventh mainland bridge, bridge now. Oh. We have not built any bridge since the military handed over to us. In fact, we are now down by one. The military handed over three bridges. Eco Bridge is down. There isn't a fourth mainland. We should be on the seventh mainland bridge if we are building one bridge for six years. So, Mr. Baniwa Rodzaivo, the other thing that distinguishes from my interaction with him, you know, those of us in the faith that I subscribe to, love and empathy is important. Yeah. I've watched this man who, by the grace of God, I pray and call governor in waiting. I've watched him closely. Mm -hmm. And he genuinely wakes up with a care. He does not see why the child of the sweeper on the street should not have access to the best quality of education mm. so that he can write. You see, we'll that, get, we'll get to that, that makes a difference. We'll so, get so, to so, that. so that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here <laughs> with total support for this candidate. And if there's anyone who cares to listen to me, I recommend him to you on equivocally, unabashedly, and very determinedly, knowing that this candidate will make Lagos the kind of Lagos that will serve all of us. Thank oh so my much. goodness. Thank and so I much. don't know if we should clap <laughs> for that, but then, um, this is the kind of passion we see on the streets That's of Lagos. It. If Lagos was working, we would not be having these basic concerns. And one of those basic concerns for us as well is housing. So, mm. Mr. Shagun, what do you say about the current housing situation in Lagos right now? What do you have to say about it? Well, as we know, um, like you said, Lagos is not working. And one of the things the current administration likes to tout, it is uh, revenue collection. Mm -hmm. And the basic concept of uh, revenue taxation is a progressive tax. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the concept is 
you tax the wealthy so you can provide for the less privileged. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in Lagos, that is not being done. And housing is one place where you can see where it manifests tremendously. If you go to a place like Lagos Island, that place is simply not habitable. Mm -hmm. And yet, they give some of the largest votes to the current administration, mm -hmm. the current party in that government. And it's time for those people to wake up mm -hmm. and ask themselves. It's essentially because you can't keep voting for the same people and they don't deliver. We need to have a concept in Nigeria and Lagos like Chelsea. If the coach doesn't deliver, i.e. the governor, sack him until they deliver. Forget who's going to figure it out or how they're going to do it. They would now figure it out knowing that even within four years, they don't deliver. Now, why I have joined Badiwa's campaign? Because he has a comprehensive plan for housing. I mean, among, first of all, when he's going to solve the traffic problem, which actually undermines the economy mm -hmm. and which basically affects everyone's lifestyle and everything. But with his housing program, he's going to have a plan where he's going to have because Lagos is congested, there's not a lot of land space. You're going to have to organize. I mean, there's nothing in Nigeria that is a problem that is not, cannot be solved with us organizing ourselves for production. That's what society is. Mm -hmm. And he has a plan whereby he's going to take, play, take a place like Lagos Island. You're going to have, try to bring the landlords to cooperate, to build more modern, higher capacity housing. So the first thing that does is create, no, first of all, it's going to dampen the cost of housing because there's more availability because it's a demand and supply problem. And then those currently there are in more habitable um, mm. housing units. And then the last thing about that is that even where you are, where he hasn't built, because you created more availability, your landlord isn't feeling that, there's not that pricing pressure. Mm. So the point is this is the first administration. After, I think we have a 4 million housing deficit, deficit. in Lagos. And he has studied that. And he has a comprehensive plan such that, for instance, when he builds a rail network, it's going to make more far out places accessible uh -huh. so that you don't have to leave in the city center. Uh -huh. And it now so makes it functional for you to get to work, but at a cheaper housing with better lifestyle and things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing, Mr. Shogun. I mean, you, you, you literally broke it down in an amazing way. For me, personally, is waste management and the young men on the street running after cars and just asking for money. You see, those two things give me headache. Like in the morning, you're just driving down or you're taking public transportation and then you get a certain location where there's traffic gridlock. You're not just dealing with the fact that your car is not moving. You're dealing with the stench coming in to the car. And that alone can reduce the quality of your life by how many, I don't even know how many years you can get. Sometimes you feel in the car, you can just literally see your years dropping in the car, you can feel it. And you're wondering, like with all the IGRs, I mean, by H1 2021, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, now Lagos did over 267 trillion. But you are living with dirt on the street. I mean, that's basic, basic human living. Like you should be able to make mm. the environment livable. And Lagos rose up in ranks to second worst livable city in the world. I mean, how do you do that with that amount, much, um, that much amount of money? So it makes us think, how about the young men on the street? So one morning I was going to work, what happens? I see a young man with swollen face, literally swollen face. He had just gotten beaten that morning. And that's supposed to be a tax collector. I mean, mm. the money you collect from those buses, I mean, it's indirect tax. So that's a tax collector. Shouldn't he have more respect that being beaten or hit by a bus or fighting, you know, or running in rugged shoes. Sometimes you see them running in bad shoes. And I'm wondering, the people in charge of these things, are they not concerned about the welfare of these young men that can be further placed in better situations? So those are my concerns. And that's why, of course, I joined the campaign of our yeah. amazing but Mr. Gbadiboro's revival because he speaks to these issues. He cares. He, he's particular about this. So would you like to address our concerns that we've highlighted here today? Yes, yes. I think that the foundation of the better Lagos, the mm. new Lagos, is the transportation system. Mm. First of all, we need to have a circulation system across Lagos State that creates that creates a truly intermodal means of transportation across Lagos. Mm. So we're going to properly dredge our waterways and have industrial ferries connecting people and moving people around the way it was done in Latif Jaconde's time, uh -huh. right? So we're having people move from Ikurudu in record time to Lagos Central, right? Mm -hmm. So we are also reducing the pressure on our road infrastructure 
and our bridges. Also, we are going to deliver four rails in four years, mm. right? Currently, it's taking, 20, it's taking them 20 years to do 16 kilometers of rail. Meanwhile, they took money, according to their books, 1.2 billion to, to do 160 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So at the rate they're going, it's going to take 200 years for them to properly rail Lagos State the way it ought to be. And, we don't, and that's, that we don't have that time. We don't have that time <laughs> at all. We don't have 200 you know? years. So, so we're looking at delivering four rails in four years. Now, mm -hmm. the wonderful benefit of that is that, like he has said, it then reduces the pressure on land in Lagos Central. Mm -hmm. You start to open up places like Ikorodu, the Badagri Axis, or Jaw and Badagri, and also make sure that we're restoring transportation that's going down to Badagri. Mm. Currently, the blue line that they talked about so much, nobody's using it today. Oh. Nobody got on the blue line today. You know, and Lagos City has been run on so much tokenism and politics. Mm. And we're trying to get away from that. So, as opposed to stopping at mile 12, that blue line is going to get to Badagri. So we start to rebuild the tourist industry that we used to have on that axis and allow people to be able to have access to that. So also doing that then starts to reduce pressure mm. on land and starts to make more parts of Lagos feasible for developers to build in. Mm. And also, like he mentioned as well, our plan is to have a situation where funds that we get from um, he heavy value real estate is channeled into a social housing development fund. Okay. Right, And we're also going to involve the private sector heavily because we don't believe that our government should be limited in its development by its purse strings. The private sector needs to come in and get involved because Lagos State is a state that can actually afford to allow for a lot of projects to be feasible. The role as government is to have oversight and to ensure that the price points that these services are delivered to the people of Lagos is extremely competitive, is extremely affordable, and then the project is done with high quality to, in the fastest possible time to have the most impact on the most amount of people and ensure that these projects are then transferred back to government in record time. Oh. So that is what our interest in. But we must ensure that maximum amount of projects are going on at the same time. That's where we're going in terms of transportation. Yeah. And that also ties in housing. Yeah. Because then you can now have a decentralized level of development. Currently, all development is too centralized. Yeah. We need to decentralize it. Also, we're going to open the BRT lanes to the private sector as well, especially innovative ride-sharing buses you, from your cool. business. You can book a ride for all your workers. workers. And if you have the bus that can take that capacity, why can't they use the BRT lane? Why should it be a monopoly? And BRT also shares our lane too. Exactly. And also, <laughs> you also know that we are highly underserved because you're waiting for a bus, it's waiting for almost 20 minutes. Oh my God. So, literally, we want a situation where every three minutes a bus is coming. Yeah. And that's because we've opened up that lane. Also, we're going to set a benchmark for the quality of roads that we have in Lagos State yes. and tie the life expectancy of that road to the payment to the contractor. Mm. Because the scam of six months doing road every six months and watching the way a rainy season something is a scam that has to go. Exactly. You know? Considering Lagos is in a center where it yes. rains a lot. So exactly. why are these rains and washing off the road? A key driver that's going to put all of this together is to have a robust, autonomous local government system. Hmm. where you have potential governors as local government chairmen that are visionary, that live to serve their people. So all those inner roads across Lagos State, Nigeria, if you're not doing Oshodi, in Badagri, these places, it will be their focus. The state government has no business doing inner roads in local governments. And we need to ensure that local governments are autonomous, they're receiving money, because that also ties into security. That ties into data gathering, right? And having a robust, look, a robust local government that works will make my own job easier, mm. right? And yes. allow for me to have more oversight responsibility. So that's, so we've touched on transportation, we've touched on housing, and we're talking about security now. Youth unemployment is really what this is about. Yes. But it has even a bigger problem with society because, you see, the more young people in primary school are looking at a 17-year-old carrying a plastic and hitting a bus and getting money. And the people they are looking at are people that are rubbing shoulders with potential presidents or want to be presidents and or governors or ministers and all of that. Then you have set a precedent. These children will not finish school. They will just go on the road and be like their older brother or their cousin. And if you look at, if you trace the number of agros in 2015 to the number of agros now, they've multiplied. And all of this is also tied to drugs. It's tied to a culture of violence because the more violent and aggressive you are, 
the they more you can rise. Go. But then you see, the issue is this. If one of these young men that are running on the road get hit by a car, that's it. No welfare. They don't, no welfare. They generate 120 billion every year. These funds are not accounted for. These funds don't even, you don't see it on these people that are collecting this money. So we need to have a system where, where and, and all of this system is created in such a way so that every four years, these young men can be used to perpetrate voter suppression, voter intimidation, and all of that. So we're going to completely, we're going to do the work so we depend on people to put us in power. We don't yeah. need any of these young men to be doing that anymore. Yeah. What we're going to do is create an alternative means for them to earn a living, give them new skills, and build this policy with them based on the local governments that they are based in, yeah. right? And after two years of doing that, then will now anybody that is still trying to pervade the law will then face the law. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that we'll work with them as stakeholders and give them skills and employability skills because it's not just about them on the road. It's about the young people that are coming out after. after the young people that will not finish primary school or finish secondary school because they are looking at these people and feel that that's the way to go. So these are some of the things that we're going to tackle and ensure that the young people of Lagos become productive members of society. I know as His Excellency Peter Obi constantly says, we're moving Nigeria from consumption to production. production. And that is going to happen in Lagos State. Yes. Oh, Lagos, you can hear that. We are moving also, as the whole Nigeria is going from consumption to production, we are going along with them as well, productively. Yes. Would you like to add something? Yes, Amadi, I wanted to respond to something you said about the tax collector being beaten up. And I think it's important for Lagosians to understand that what we have in Lagos, take it or not, is actually feudalism. It's normally in the feudal culture and history that you have tax collectors of the feudal lord mm -hmm. being beaten up. People need to reflect on this. Lagos is actually the one place where you've had the same government for 25 years. So everything, you can't well, say it's because of the rotation. The now, what you have is a system where you can actually have someone use the resources of the state, run for president. We all know that's happening. We all have a system. And we, it's just <laughs> intolerable. Normally, the way you usually overthrow a feudal lord is people carry sticks and fire and run him out of town or burn down his castle. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have to do that. Okay. All you have to do is show up and vote yes. to change that. And Lagosians need to wake up to do that because this is not going to change otherwise. Okay. It's not going to change by itself. Understand that you're in a feudal system and it's, the structure is built to serve that system. And that is really what this whole race is about. Oh, that's so sad, actually. Would you like to ask something to that, Mr. Kola? I just wanted <laughs> to appeal to Lagosians. You know, anytime a group of people look and it appears that the character of the government is not exactly representative of the character of the people. You then have to ask why. Why? It's a different thing if soldiers do a coup. And because they came in by the butt of the gun, they may not represent us. I think Lagosians are, by and large, decent people. They are welcoming people. They are considerate people. Mm -hmm. The question we need to ask is, why does it appear that our government is different? And I want to appeal to Lagosians. It is because, for example, in the last election, for a city of 20 million people, only 1 million people elected the governor. Don't let anybody tell you that your vote does not count. I want to appeal to everyone. Let us come out and vote. Yes. There are seven million of us. By the time seven million of us come out to vote, that government that we elect is most likely to represent our character. When half a million or just one million elect leaders for 20 million people, there's a very high possibility That's that the government you are electing is not representative of the wishes of the seven the million. True. Don't let people tell us that our votes does not matter. If it does not matter, why are they buying, why are they attempting to buy the vote? Why is it being if it has no value, why are they paying us? Why are they right. attempting to buy it? Your vote counts. Yes. The parents, I understand, the, His Excellency was showing me some data. The parents have passed a vote of no confidence in the education system. In Lagos State, 17%, only 17% of primary school students are in public schools. Only 25% of secondary school students are in, secondary, uh, are in public schools. He showed me that. Our vote 
makes a difference. Let's this election, let seven million of us mm. come out and express our preferences. Yes. And then let us see whether the people we elect will not be those who are like us. Yes. Yes. And like Mr. Kola has rightly said, we cannot overemphasize the importance of ensuring that your vote counts. We have an amazing presidential candidate in the center, and that's his ex, um, he, our incoming president, Mr. Peter Ubi, uh, telling us that he's going to do all these amazing things that we believe in. But you see, the president is not going to do everything. You still need a governor that is going to impact your life directly in your state. Make all the right decisions in your state. Lagos currently has one of the highest number of registered voters. So we are not just going to sit back and let a certain number of few who have been induced by some certain welfareism to vote their choice. And it doesn't actually represent the people. We want the candidate that truly cares and is going to build an inclusive Lagos that does not practice a kind of class system where some people are more important than some people or some local government where a certain party chieftain lives he gets the good road and the other ones everybody else can go to hell we have his, mr badiboros vivo as the preferred candidate of the labor party and also our by the grace of god our incoming governor in lagos do you have one or two words for the electorate in lagos and even in nigeria as a whole Yes, thank you. Um, Lagos State is one of the, is the largest um, has the largest number of registered voters. So this state has should play a defining role in the emergence of a president in this country. So I call on everybody that is trying to get their voters cards to not give up. I know that they are frustrating you. We are watching. We are monitoring. And we're also going around to meet all these INEC officials to ensure that voters' cards are being released. So we know that they're trying to suppress our voice. We know that they're trying to suppress our votes. Don't be discouraged. Go out, do your best to get your voters' cards. And on the day of election, try and make sure you talk to at minimum 10 people that you know have voters' cards to come out and vote. This year, this election will be like nothing that Nigeria has ever seen before. It will be like nothing that Lagos has ever seen before. And it's time for us to put in position servant leaders and leaders that work for us, be accountable to us, and we will ensure that our interests are met. And that's the way Nigeria and Lagos is going to move forward. So we are counting on you. We don't have bullion vans. We are counting on you, the people, to ensure that you install leaders, not rulers, leaders that will work and serve you well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. And that kind of brings us to the end of the segment. Um, my name is Priscilla Amadi, and we have Mr. Kola. Kola, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Bose, think, no, <laughs> and and then, Banjo. And we are all members of the team, and we are telling you, Lagosians, allow your votes to count, participate, and be heard. Don't complain the next four years. It's going to happen in March. Be ready, get your PVCs, and God bless everyone, God bless Nigeria, and God bless Lagos State.